Well, welcome to the National Iron and Steel Heritage Museum, uh, Steel Stories uh, series where we talk about uh, iron and steel uh, history uh, as it relates to the people, process, and products of iron and steel. I'm Scott Houston, the president of that organization, and uh, tonight we're very excited to uh, celebrate Women's History Month uh, by having uh, Steve um, Suchaya and Don Riley, uh, Steve Chairman uh, of the Selection Committee of the America's Cup Hall of Fame in Bristol, Rhode Island. And Don uh, is uh, a, uh, a sailor, uh, but uh, she is uh, uh, accomplished in many things that we're going to learn about, but most notably uh, that I, I think as well is that she was the first female skipper of, a, of a, an America's Cup boat in the Challenge Series uh, leading up to, to the, uh, the actual duel. We'll learn a little bit more about the format of the America's Cup, um, but that also included the first all-female crew. Uh, and it's just uh, an amazing uh, journey that we're gonna hear about. And I believe that uh, uh, most of this uh, career is, you know, 1992, 95, and 2000, and, and, and we're gonna hear about the various structures of, and responsibilities. Uh, that that burden uh, of of running a you know multi million dollar uh, operation uh, comes with that. So we're extremely happy. I, I'm, I'm gushing, but uh, we'll get to the uh, we'll get to the end. So um, you know, I think one of the things that really I get a question a lot about that I'll I'll uh, answer real quick is um, you know how how is Lukens connected and steel connected to uh, the America's Cup boats? Uh, you know, it's a common a question where we just talk about well, I thought they were I thought they were wooden boats, and um, you know it's amazing uh, then to uh, run across a book that my great uncle Stuart wrote in 1937, uh, where he mentions he was kind of the historian of the family and vice president of the company, um, very much interested in history, and he wrote this book in 37 about the uh, America's Cup defenders that Luke and Steele uh, had had supplied materials for. And so that's just amazing. Uh, and that really, you know, got the question of, well, how did this all come about? The Lucan Steel Company was, you know, early 1800s, as I said, Rebecca Lucan's the first female industrialist in the second quarter. And so the Lucan Steel Company would turn out these large, wide plates of steel. Uh, that was their specialty, mostly for steam engines and railroads. Uh, and as I said, Rebecca Lukens led it right before the Civil War. Uh, they, they installed a big Corliss steam engine. And Corliss will take a, a part here later, but they installed a big Corliss steam engine in 1870 and started supplying plates for hulls of, of ships. And so that's how Lukens, uh, you know, got into a little bit of shipbuilding. Uh, mostly, again, like big, heavy stuff. So the America's Cup question was just always interesting. Well, I had a, I had a friend in uh, high school, and he lived up in Newport, and I happened to go up there, and, you know, I like to visit museums, and I went to, I found the uh, Harishoff Museum, uh, Harishoff uh, Mer Mer Marine Museum uh, in Bristol, Rhode Island, and associated is the America's Cup Hall of Fame. Well, you know, this is, I knock on the door and go, go looking around and really learning a fascinating history about the design. Uh, Nathaniel Green Harishoff uh, was a, an employee of the Corliss Steam Engine Company. And I think he became familiar with the Lucan's product when he designed and built his company uh, in, in Bristol. Uh, he used Lucan's for, uh, for some of his projects. Now, Harishoff, if you're a sailor, I mean, these are the creme de la cremes. These are great, great looks, great sleek designs, uh, you know, light, different materials and very prized, um, you, know, you know, ship just to look at and much less be on or own. Um, and so it's fascinating how, um, you know, you've got uh, Nate, uh, you know, going from Corliss to creating his own uh, company in Bristol. And I, I walk in and, and, I, and I can't remember who the gentleman was who I talked he was the curator at the at the museum there, uh, the Harrisoff Marine Museum in Bristol, and he had worked at Groton, Connecticut, on building submarines, and so he was familiar with Lukens uh, and HY80, and so we had a good discussion. And he's the one who pointed us in the direction of uh, the Hart Nautical Collection uh, for the Harrisoff uh, Manufacturing Company, um, and there at the uh, Hart is uh, Nautical Collections at MIT. 
And so back in the day, I'll show you the letter we sent up to them. Uh, and that's where I'll just really get into this quickly is, I believe it's this one, where here's the, oops, I got a screen, a screen share, right? So here we go. Uh, everybody who can see that, see that here is our, back in the days when people used to write letters, uh, you know, this is how we communicated. And, uh, you know, here is our, uh, my Sharon is great. Uh, we're still with us. But here's really where, you know, we, we, they talked about how Hart has the MIT collections and how it's likely the associations that we put steel into many, um, many uh, Harrishoff projects. They built not only sailboats, but they also built um, coastal patrol craft. And so, you know, here's the document really that, you know, which is worth it all to get. And is, you know, in that MIT collection, here is from the Harrishoff Manufacturing Company, you know, an order uh, to Lukens, uh, please furnish, uh, you know, nickel, nickel steel plates for cup defender number uh, 605. And 605 was the Reliance. It's, you know, there are many great boats in, uh, in, in this lineage of America's Cup, but the Reliance is probably seen as the creme de la creme. It was a large boat, uh, sleek and fast. And uh, it's really where they started to put some guide, they always trying to guidelines on the boat. But it's it's uh, the Cup Defender in 1903. And that was really like, oh my gosh, this is this is amazing. You know, here's Lucan's connection uh, to the Harrishoff, specifically for a Cup Defender uh, and the Reliance. Um, here's a letter correspondence you know, we're not really sure if this is for uh, a, a cup defender. You know, as I said, Harishoff was making like many, many designs of boats for many people. Uh, but, you know, it's just a correspondence from uh, Lukens. Uh, we, we, we joked that it was Brist Bristol, Connecticut, or Bristol, Rhode Island, not, not uh, Pennsylvania. Um, so we don't know if this actually got through or not. But um, again, it's just between Lukens and Harishoff. It's further establishing, you know, the relationship between the two companies. Um, and that, that, that kind of solidifies that a little bit. And then we were just like, well, how, how are these things made? And it's, I'm not really an expert on that, but, um, there is, uh, let me see. I'm sorry. I think it was these at the top, um, where here is the construction of the rainbow. And it says, and I believe this is, uh, uh, Arcadia Publishing's book on uh, America's Cup in Bristol, Rhode Island. And in there, there are these uh, pictures, and it talks about the rainbow is plated with steel above the waterline and bronze below. But you can see the frame, aluminum construction, bracings, keel, uh, and the side, and this would have been the plate above the waterline, uh, was, uh, was a nickel-plated steel, as we saw. And here's some, you know, further construction diagrams uh, about, you know, the keel, lead, really balanced and then trying to keep it light. These fascinating designs. Um, and uh, one other picture here is the Columbia. Um, and inside her hull were a network of steel beams, braces and emptiness. And um, on the top, you know, was that nickel clad plate steel. Uh, here is the Columbia, not every, you know, if you're a sailor, even out there, this happens sometimes, things don't go away, you're right. But here's the uh, Columbia, <laughs> looks like, a little demasted, uh, but had steel top sides and manganese bronze below the waterline. So why they use two different materials above and below the waterline, uh, somebody will have to, you know, chime in on that. But just want to cover a little bit of construction. As I showed, you know, here's the interior of a cup boat, not comfy, not, you know, these are work, these are race boats. Um, and uh, so just a couple more images that Stephen provided us. Thank you. Um, you know, here again is the construction of a, a cup a defender, uh, and I'm not sure which one, but you can see the bracings. And then here's here's probably some Lucan's plate right over here. Uh, you know that uh, is above the waterline. That's that's me. Sorry, I really didn't have a presentation. Um, yeah, lead, you know, the keel construction, here's some bronze below the waterline and above the water, waterline probably about up here, maybe. 
fascinating. I always love how these, you know, you get pictures, a lot of pictures of them after they're, after they're built on the side. And these uh, tremendous machines. And I think one more here. So again, you know, that's the Lucan's connection to iron and steel. Uh, we were happy to work with the Hershoff Museum, the MIT, and, you know, we're very happy. Again, uh, Stephen is going to introduce Dawn Riley again uh, and, and to talk about her experience in, in this great history of the America's Cup. So, again, I appreciate everybody for joining us tonight, and uh, this should be very interesting. So, Stephen, hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Scott. Really appreciate it. Again, my name is Steve Tsuchi. I'm uh, chairman of the selection committee of the America's Cup Hall of Fame in Bristol, Rhode Island. The museum's located at uh, what was once the Harrisoff Manufacturing Company that built Reliance and Rainbow, among the other yachts that Scott just shared with you. Let me share some screens so I can prepare this better. Just a moment, bear with me. All right, everybody, you should be able to see the Harrisoff Marine Museum. Above is what it looks like today, naturally, and below is what it looked like back in the 1930s. So when you saw that picture of rainbow in the shed being built, well, those large buildings you see here was where, in fact, it was here is where rainbow was built and launched. Again, it's in Bristol, Rhode Island on the Narragansett Bay. And I encourage all of you to visit you can also visit our website, harrisoff.org, because we have a ton of online content uh, in, on the website. Today, I was asked by Scott and Jim and the, the head of the, uh, the Iron and Steel Museum to give a little brief history of women in the America's Cup. And so let's get started. The first female America's Cup participant was Susan Henn, born in 1853 in Scotland, and when she was just uh, still in her early 30s, commissioned the yacht Galatea. You can see her right there, Galatea on the right, versus her opponent, Mayflower, in the 1886 America's Cup. Susan Henn also has a distinction of being the owner of the first all steel hauled challenger. That's right, so Galatea, she was built in Scotland, but she used steel manufactured by the Siemens Martin Steel Company, a competitor of Lugans. Needless to say, you know, like many challengers before her and after her, uh, she was not able to win the cup, but she was not the last person uh, or last female to be involved uh, in challenging with the cup or defending it. This is a nice picture showing Susan and her husband, Lieutenant William Henn, at the helm of the yacht Galatea. And as you can see, they had a dog, but what's missing in the picture was Peggy, their pet monkey. So it's very disappointing uh, Peggy is not in the image. Eventually, she also added raccoons and some other uh, animals as well. You see, after the America's Cup, after they lost, they didn't leave to go home immediately. They stuck around in uh, America, cruising around the East Coast. And she also did some hunting as well, not with the rifle currently, but with a Colt 45 uh, um, uh, revolver. So. Now, fast forward to the J-class era of the 1930s, we have other females who were actively involved, notably Phyllis Sopworth. She was the husband, I mean, sorry, the wife of Tom Sopworth, who you see at the helm. Sopworth as in, you know, the Sopworth Camel airplane fame. Now, Phyllis, her main role was to serve in the afterguard of the boat, primarily as the timekeeper. I love this image because you can see in her right hand, in her palm, is a pocket watch. And there she is assisting Tom at the helm, presumably at the pre-start right here. 
In addition to fellow software, on the American side, Elizabeth Morse Hovey of Boston was involved with the Rainbow Campaign of 1937. While she wasn't on the boats during the America's Cup, I mean, on the helm during the America's Cup races, she was handily handling Rainbow to and from the race course. And again, look at the size and scale. Rainbow, you can see right there in the foreground, gives you a really good idea of the scale of these massive J-boats. But Elizabeth was also great at sailing dinghies as well, so she can do it all. Now into the 12 meter era, women continued to be involved as well. But again, I want to be clear, the America's Cup largely has been a male dominated sport, but in the 86, 87 Louis Vuitton Challenger Series in Perth, you know, for the Challenger Series to determine who would challenge the America's Cup, Dory Vogel of Rhode Island sailed as navigator on Stars and Stripes during one or two of the trial races. She also served as a reserve navigator for the primary boat as well. Moving on into the America's Cup class, also known as the International America's Cup class, which were larger, lighter, and faster than the 12 meters, we finally get to one of the most important, if not the most important female America's Cup sailors, and that's Dawn Riley. She was the first active crew member in the 170 year history of the America's Cup. She served as pit person on board America Cubed, which was one of the defender candidates for the 1992 America's Cup. As a pit person, really, she was like the link between uh, the floor deck and the sail trimmers above. She often worked down below handling the sails, but also really anticipating maneuvers and it required a sailor to do it and not just anybody who can um, not get seasick. So America Cube end up winning the Defender Trials and more importantly, they won the America's Cup as well. And that made Don Riley the first true active crew member, as opposed to somebody just in the afterguard, you know, timekeeping or whatever, to win the America's Cup. So it's a big deal. And for the next America's Cup in 1995, Bill Cook, the man who made the America Cubed uh, America's Cup defense possible, said, you know what? I want to have more than one Don Riley on my boat. I want just whole bunch of Don Riley since you know, we can't clone Don. So what they ended up doing is just hiring and building an all women's team. And that became the first all women's America's Cup team in the long history of the America's Cup. Mighty Mary was their final boat. And you can see this in this image here. In this America's Cup, Don was one of the trimmers. Um, and here she is right here working her magic. Now Mighty Mary, made it to the Defender Finals, but unfortunately in, uh, in the final race of it, they lost to Team Dennis Connor. But wow, they were leading by, a massive, uh, by massive margins, but somehow by luck in many ways, I would say, D uh, Dennis Connor was able to come back and win the cup, uh, the defense. I'm gonna interrupt, it was definitely luck. Yeah, definitely luck, <laughs> there you go, exactly. And guess what, Dennis Connor won the Defender Trials, but he ended up losing to New Zealand, so. You know, that's that. But I want to say this, after Don Riley's role in the Mighty Mary, uh, Mighty Mary campaign, she continued her involvement in the America's Cup. Uh, for the 2000 America's Cup series, she became the first female CEO of an America's Cup campaign when she led the America True uh, American Challenger in, uh, in New Zealand. And after that, uh, during the uh, 2004 to 2007 cycle, she was the general manager of the K-Challenge America's Cup for the 2007 uh, series. So I want to be clear that, uh, you know, for this Women's History Month, it's a, a great delight for all of you to be able to hear from Don Riley, who, again, has been, in my opinion, the most significant female sailor in the long history of the America's Cup. And with that, I'll pass on the baton to Don.
Thank you, Steve. Um, it's nice to be here, everybody. Spring is coming. COVID is going to be over. We're all going to get out on the water um, soon, let's hope. And uh, actually, no, we're bullish at Oak Cliff. We're definitely getting on the water this summer. So I'm going to give a little bit of my history, fill in a few little other bits and pieces that Steve already mentioned, show a video, tell a couple stories, and then I really want to be able to talk about anything that you guys want to. This is this is your hour. So backing up a bit, well, I guess not back to the 1900s, but I was born and bred in Michigan, grew up on a wooden boat, uh, and we raced with my family. My father, no, not, we sailed with my family. We were cruising, but it was like racing because every time there was a boat on the horizon, he decided that we were in a race. And so from the age of three, four, I was learning how to trim sails and do uh, head sail changes with Hanks and jive wooden spinnaker poles and all of those, you know, arm 80 type things. Um, he was a hundred thousand percent against using an engine ever. So we were probably the only three children that begged to go home and do our homework and the answer was trim the spinnaker faster. So um, that was the, the somewhat torture that I grew up uh, on the Great Lakes. One thing that was amazing though, is we took that 36 foot wooden Great Lakes cutter and went on a year's cruise from Detroit, out the Barge Canal, up to Maine, down to Florida, to the Bahamas, to the Virgins, to Grenada and back in a year. So I didn't go to school officially, but the, the life learning was incredible to stop in museums, to see whales, to see the Statue of Liberty from the, you know, the deck of your boat the first time, all of that. When I came back to Michigan, um, somebody asked me to go, sit, go racing on their etchels. And I'm not positive how many people are racer racers or sailors or cruisers or classic aficionados. Um, but there was an Etchells, which is, you know, a 30 some foot boat and three or four people sail on it. And I went out at age 13 and with people that I thought were really, really old in hindsight, they were 30. Um, and I went racing with them and I knew what I was talking about compared to them. And I thought this sailing stuff was easy and I was obsessed with it because we did well. And uh, I literally became um, a sailmaker. I installed electronics. I helped winter um, winter work on boats. You know, spring launch, fall haul. I would make sandwiches. I would do anything I could to be on or around boats. And eventually, even though I did go to Michigan State, I used working on and around boats to put myself through college. And uh, somehow I was going to get a real job at some point. And now I'm 56 years old and I'm still in the marine industry. So it is the, the type of thing that if you do what you love and you can make a living at it, you know, there's nothing, nothing more special than that. So I definitely feel lucky. I'm, just, I'm not going to talk about Oak Cliff a lot unless people want to. And there's chats, uh, videos in the chat. But Oak Cliff is where I am now, and it is a training and coaching center for athletes who want to do the America's Cup, to race around the world, to go to the Olympics, or to become a professional. It's kind of like a hands-on technical trade school designed after what took me 50 years to do. So um, we have students that come in, they train, they sail, they race. We're going to the Great Lakes. We do Bermuda race. We have a significant fleet of classic yachts. We do high performance Olympic sailing. And um, this year, because of COVID, we had all these kids who are going to be remote school. We said, why did they have to go home to their parents if they're here sailing and it's going to be warm until Thanksgiving? So we started a high school and it's a fully accredited um, high school in partnership with an online provider with uh, learning coaches and tutors on site. So it's a hybrid between a brick and mortar school and an online school. It's accredited in all 50 states and they get to go sailing. So that that's kind of like the quick um, Oak Cliff part. So that brings us all the way up to the whip bread, which is right before my foray into the America's Cup. Actually, let me say my first time I saw the America's Cup. How many people that have your video on, raise your hand if you know what the candy store is in Newport, Rhode Island. There's a handful. It's a bar. I'll tell you that much. It's a bar on Bannister's Wharf. So when on that year's cruise, when I was 13, my sister was 11, my brother was seven, we 
of course, were supposed to be asleep in the forward cabin when our parents were talking about um, talking to their friends partying in the main cabin. And we kept hearing about this candy store. And of course, we didn't ask them about it. We went up and down the streets and we were looking for this magical candy store in Newport, Rhode Island, while the America's Cup trials were happening. So Dennis Kahn, no, Dennis was, I didn't see Dennis. I saw Gary Jobson, Ted Turner, television cameras, you know, following him around. And we were like, that's cool. The sailing's cool, but where is the candy store? And it wasn't until I was there as a grown adult, like at age 22, that somebody said, let's go to the candy store. And I went, oh, because we never found it at age 13. We could not find candy to save our life. Um, So anyway, so my first foray into the America's Cup was seeing it from the deck of our boat and then almost getting pushed off the dock by Ted Turner as he was being followed by women and TV cameras and whatever. So I had an inkling. I did tell my mom, well, that's cool. I'm going to do that one day. And of course, at age 13 as a female, they're like, sure, sure, go ahead. You know, good job. You try that without any reality set in. Little did they know I was going to make my own reality. Um, So I put myself through college and I tried to get a job after I graduated and it was the recession and I didn't have a job. I worked on some of the boats, went down to Florida, was being a professional boat captain. And I heard about a team that was going to go around the world with an all women's team. Now I know it's national history or women's history month. At that point, I had not really ever sailed with many other women. And I was like, I'm not going to go around the world with a bunch of women, which was completely bizarre. Um, when you say it out loud now, and a friend of mine told me to can take a look in the mirror and let's sort this out. Um, so I ended up on Maiden, the whip red around the world race, which I'm sure most of you have seen the movie Maiden. If not, you can rent it. And it's a pretty good documentary. It's won quite a few awards, but that was 33,000 miles around the world. They thought we were going to die. Um, they had bets that we were going to make it to the end of the English channel. We would cry. We would come home. Not only did we make it from England to Punta de Las to Perth, Australia, to Auckland, New Zealand, back to Punta, up to Fort Lauderdale, back to England. We survived. We had no major injuries. We helped, uh, Claire, our doctor, helped save another life on another boat where they'd lost him overboard, and we ended up second. So, of course, as a young, somewhat cocky female, I'm like, okay, that's done. Men and women are going to sail together. So then I came back from that going, I don't know. Should I do the Olympics or should I do the America's Cup? Huh. And um, I determined savvily that the Olympics was hard to raise money for and I wasn't the right size. So I would just go do the America's Cup. Um, Dennis Connor was supposed to give us an interview, me and Martha Parker at Team One Newport, and he bailed on the interview. So I called up my friend that I had just met in the Whipbread, Gary Jobson, who was with Bill Koch. And I said, hey, Um, I'm in San Diego and I'd like to uh, try out for the America's cup. And he said, okay, show up tomorrow. And I thought I was coming for an interview. I didn't realize it was an actual tryout. And I had my best pair of khakis on. Um, he reminds, I don't remember, but he remembers that my fingernails were polished. I was definitely wearing earrings and he was like, no, we're going sailing. So I changed in a parking lot and went sailing and I made the team on that open tryout. We had four sessions of about 40 people each session trying out. I was lucky to make that. Um, And then, so that was 1992. And uh, as Steve already said, we we ended up winning. And then I um, was planning and part of the manifesto to plan the second America's Cup, which is an all women's team. And I was the team captain. And there had been a mutiny on the whip red round the world boat called Heineken. And we ended up, um, I ended up getting called by the sponsor and I had about 24 hours to decide whether to rescue the team and to bring a few friends. And so we ended up flying to Punta del Este, Uruguay and taking a boat that wasn't in great shape around the world. Uh, We survived. We ended up second to last on that one, but we survived. After losing our rudder three times, I think we actually did pretty well. Uh, There's a book about that. And that lent me to be a good speaker for international uh, hostile takeover bids for business in my motivational speaking career. After that, I came back, went into the women's team, America Cubed. um, And we're going to talk about this. I have a short video. We're going to talk about exactly how that finished up. 
the women's team, as Steve mentioned, we have uh, we had myself. I was the only person who had actually raced on America's Cup before. We had some Olympians. We had an American Gladiator. We had some rowers. Uh, we had a power lifter. And, uh, and my job was actually there. Leslie Egnot was the skipper and I was the team captain. And then I also was running around the boat and the way that I got that I was one of the helms people, but the, the, the fourth time, since I was the only person that knew how to do all of this stuff, you know, the, about the fourth time I gave the wheel to JJ or to Leslie said, here, hold this and ran forward and fixed it, fixed something. The coaches were like, we think it's better that you're not holding on to the wheel so you can run around and fix stuff, which, which made sense. At the time, I was a little bit frustrated, but I also knew in my gut that my best thing always has been finding a problem, finding the fire, putting it out, you know, running into danger and saving the day on a sailboat race. Um, after that, I did do television, and then I went and was the mercenary general manager of the French America's Cup uh, in Valencia in 2007. And then that brought us right up to where I am today. But let me show you a video of the first four campaigns together. And I will talk over it so that you can know what you're talking or what you're looking at. So here we go. So, the America's Cup in 1992, 95 were mostly Americans. The Whipbread was international. Whipbread was sponsored by a beer that uh, anytime you drink a beer for a whole year, you get sick and tired of it. But it, they were a great sponsor for many, many years. And the race was conceived in a bar, so it all worked out. In 1989, 90, the world was pink because it was made in, and it was the 80s, big hair and all. These are the America's Cup boats, which earlier tonight somebody required, re, um, referred to as the old boats. I'm like, okay, thanks. Um, coming into Fort Lauderdale in our bathing suits and dancing in our foul weather gear through the Southern Ocean. I do like match racing, and we can talk more about that whenever you want. Um, either way, you tend to go a little bit crazy sometimes when you're out at sea or in the America's Cup. That's... Um, Buddy Melges and Bill Cove, uh, Dave Dellenbaugh, John Coley, some amazing coaches. When there's only one ponytail in the America's Cup, that's 92 and 95 is a bunch. We um, get the spinnakers back in the day up in 13 seconds or down in a little bit more than that. And they were, um, they are generally 5,000 square feet. So a pretty big amount of spinnaker cloth. It's the end of a boom. going 30 knots and that is a brooch if you turn your head with the horizon you'll see how far we were tipped over that is the aforementioned Dennis Connor who blew us off Tom Whitten's nice though from the top of a mast that was about a 25 30 foot wave it just doesn't look like it on the fixed video we were sailing amongst the icebergs we did wear safety harnesses, and Dennis Connor did lose a half a million dollar mast, but the French had dropped their boat, oopsie, and the keel fell off. The Australians, although, became the only boat to actually fully sink during an America's Cup race. And their sponsors took full advantage of it, and the next day they had an ad in all of the papers nationwide that said, nothing goes down better than a Foster's. And I think you guys are all old enough to know that's beer. When I'm talking to kids, I have to explain it to them. <laughs> I don't corrupt the youth, really. That was the women during a Yo Play ad. We do not hike with our ankles crossed. It was just for the cameras. Heineken going upwind, Maiden going upwind. You've all heard at Regattas, it's never like this here. Well, they say it's all downwind around the world, they lie. Those were high, high-tech graphics back in the 90s. Gloria got some kelp 
Off of the rudder, we gave her dish soap to wash her hair. Those boats were the first like surfing boats. Oops, and Susie Leach got a few stitches a couple of times. She eventually learned to put her head on the other side of the spinnaker pole. That's Maverick up the mast. And that's sailing into Auckland, New Zealand, my very favorite place to sail in the whole, whole, whole world. So um, that is the only video I'm going to show tonight. Again, in the chat, there's video. You can go to the YouTube for Oak Cliff. Um, there's a whole bunch, but you know, I don't want to take up too much time, and I do want to get to question and answers. So I'm going to talk about two more things. I'm going to tell two stories that um, I think are relevant and then talk about the day in the life of an America's Cup and then touch on what's happening down in New Zealand. So let me just start with the two stories. So we already talked about, um, I was the only female in 1992. There was a fair amount of media. I, somebody, one of the kids found a People magazine. You know, it was People magazine, Time magazine, USA Today, all the different TV stuff. Um, and yet it paled in comparison to 1995 when we had the all women's team. That was just groundbreaking. And that really changed the trajectory of sailing for women. And it was in 1995 where most people don't remember, unless you're in baseball, there was a professional farm league level, all women's team. The league of their own came out, but there was actually a, a women's team uh, in real baseball um, there was also it was the year of the Olympics, uh, what year of the women and the Olympics in Atlanta. So it was really, you know, Hillary Clinton came on the scene. It really was a big change. And we were ripe for that. And, and I believe a significant part of it. But I have two stories that show just randomly the change in mentality about women and athletes and women in sailing. Both of those events were in San Diego. In 1992, I was the only woman. Um, and we all lived in corporate apartments, Oakwood apartments, and, you know, they're the typical San Diego two-story. In the middle, there's a pool. And most importantly, there's a hot tub. Because you know how I said that it's a big lie that it's mostly downwind around the world? It's also the big lie that it's warm in San Diego. It might be warm on the beach or inland, but once you get out under the marine layer, the fog, it is so cold. So we would have a really long day. And I will pause and give you just an idea of the day of a typical day. We would wake up at 5.40, we'd wake up before. 5.45 was the beginning of workout. And if you were late, the whole team was doing push-ups. Then you would go and have your shower, your breakfast, and then you would have a team meeting for what was the plan for the day. That's something we still do at Oak Cliff every single day because you need to know who fixed what on the boat overnight. So you have to make sure that they put it back right. You need to know what the weather is. You want to know who the sponsors are on site. You want to get an update on the technology. You want to um, find out when the barbecue is that the families are involved. You know, it's just such an important meeting every single morning. Then the sailors would load the boats because the boats are taken out every single night. So the sailors would take the boats... Um, take all of the sails, carry them all down the dock, load the chase boats with the other practice sails, test sails, backup sails, and then you would tow out. You would tow out for about an hour to get to the race course, and then you would sail for about five or six hours. Then you come back in, you tow back in, you take all the sails off, and then you have to do your area checks. So you have a uh, different area on each uh, each person. So whether it's winches or it's rigging or it's um, technology or debrief or electronics or just washing the boat or putting the skirts on, because back then we used to put these big skirts under the boat to hide what we had going on underneath. Um, and then you would obviously take all the sails up into the sail loft. Those would get fixed. Then you would have a debrief and then you would go home and have dinner and then you would fall in bed. In between getting home and dinner, we were often so cold and tired that we would jump into the hot tub. And the hot tub's in the middle of this complex. And of course, we're not the only people there. And of course, if you happen to be, say, 25, 30-year-old female who's living there, and you see a bunch of huge, beautiful, athletic men jumping into the hot tub every night, you rearrange your schedule. And you just happen to be in the hot tub as well. 
And so to give you an idea, Rock Ferrigno was one of our grinders. Um, Ferrigno is in, his uncle was the Incredible Hulk. Um, Johnny McGowan, who's a, a wonderful trimmer and an artist. You know, we had these like these very interesting and, and beautiful athletic young men. And I was just, you know, one of the guys. So I'd be in the hot tub. And there was this one woman who was a nurse. And she was there and she was talking to Rock, totally flirting with Rock. And uh, what do you do? You know, almost touching his muscles. He goes, oh, I'm a grinder. You know, Johnny McGowan is, yeah, I'm a trimmer. I'm the artist of the boat. I make the sails look beautiful. They were just laying it on thick. And then somebody goes, you know, Dawn's on the boat too. She was like, what? And I said, yeah, I do pit. She was like, on the boat? I'm like, yep. And then all of a sudden this light bulb, she goes, oh, you make the sandwiches. And I, I was just flabbergasted. The guys thought it was the funniest thing they had ever heard. And they just laughed. I was like, yeah, right, lady. That's what I do. I make the sandwiches. I wasn't even going to argue. So that was 1992. Jump forward to 1995. Now, that was a race that we had the all-women's team. Dennis Connor was on ESPN the night before the first race of the Challenger Series going, I don't think I need the help of the ladies yet. And um, because he's he literally said, we'll just go out and tack. We'll just wear them out. We're men. They're women. We're stronger. We're better. We'll just tack and, and they'll be gone. Well, we did some crazy thing like 52, 58 tacks and we beat him. So then it was like, uh-oh. Um, and we really did hold our own. It came down, there's three boats, New York Yacht Club's boat, Young American, um, Dennis Connor and the women's team. And it came down to a race where whoever lost was going home. And we had the opportunity to eliminate Dennis Connor. And we were in that, um, we, we beat him. Then we found out after we beat him, when we thought we had eliminated him, that they had made a three boat deal management without the racing team involved to say that we're not going to eliminate anybody. We're just going to give the winner a couple more points. And then, so the women's team had one win. The New York Yacht Club's team, which was already in, had two. And Dennis Connor went in with zero. We were, we were heartbroken and, you know, management not believing in us. Then, and which is why, let me just, women, it's super critical to have a seat at the decision-making table. Women need to be in the boardrooms and need to be the skippers and the tacticians and the team captains and the leaders. Okay, so that's that. Um, otherwise, you get you get screwed in more ways than one. Um, so anyway, in 1995, when we had the – it went along, and then we got into the same situation. And once again, we are beating him. The difference is – so we are beating him at the last top mark by over six minutes. That's like a lifetime. I mean, nowadays that's a half a race. Um, but back then the races were two and a half hours, two hours and 36 minutes, I think was the time uh, time limit we were just talking about. And we came around the top mark. It was super, super light off of Point Loma. And we just came around rounded and we had the option of jiving, but we there was no wind. And every time you jive, especially then we were still figuring out how to do it. You know, the spinnakers can wrap around. It, it was a high risk move just to make a maneuver. And we were favored tack towards the finish line. I was up on the, the gooseneck looking over and I distinctly remember telling Dave Dellenbaugh, because there's an all women plus one man telling Dave Dellenbaugh, the only place I see wind, if I see anything is over by Point Loma. And the navigator said, we're, we're so much favored on this jibe, we should not jibe. So Dave decided to wait until they got closer to the mark and then jibe. But by that point, it was so light, they were able to jibe and split. When we jibed, they got the wind that I had seen off of Point Loma. They still were behind. They came back. They were just, they luffed us. And I'm going to go a little technical. We had an A0, which is a smaller sail designed to go downwind because it does, if you take a big sail downwind, it just falls as too much weight. So a smaller sail designed to go downwind. But once we left, 
they had more sale area, just a bigger sale. They were able to come up and we finished just like overlapped and they ended up beating us. ESPN had gone away um, to baseball because they're like, the women are going to the next round. The women's are going to go into the America's cup against, you know, or, you know, against New York, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't New York. It was young America, but whatever. Um, and, and then they had to come back and say, no, the women are eliminated. There were people crying. There was, you know, television cameras, there were um, faxes. That tells you how long ago it was. Faxes of condolence. Um, we came in. We do what you do. You get over it. And I happened to be dating a guy from New Zealand. So I was over on his base, outside his base, a couple of days later. And this homeless guy comes up. And I'm wearing my uniform because that's all the clothing you have. And he goes, are you one of those women? And I was like, um, excuse me. Uh, yeah, I think the American, he goes, the sailor women. I'm like, yep. And he goes, God wanted you to lose. I was like, oh boy, this is going to be good. And he goes, God loves you. God hates Dennis Connor. And God knows that the Kiwis are going to win. So he didn't want the women to lose. He wanted Dennis Connor to lose. I was like, oh my God. So that gives you, and as I warned you before, a rather bizarre couple of stories that to me show that in 1992, there was a woman who sailed, who was involved in the, you know, the industry that couldn't even understand that a female could be on an America's Cup boat. And in a few short years, there's a homeless guy trying to justify why the women weren't winning. So that is a bizarre indication of progress of women. And it has continued. And we can talk about that. Um, it's, let's see, 6.48. I'm going to uh, just talk a little bit before we open up to just full on question and answer, a little bit about New Zealand. So the America's Cup was supposed to start tomorrow night, our time. And there was a 22 year old guy who was COVID positive, who went to the gym and locked down Auckland. I just, as I said to some friends, I want a little sympathy for the fact that I am responsible for 20 to 30, 20 year old kids at any one time at Oak Cliff and we made it through COVID. So just think about, um, I don't see anybody that's that young. Their brains aren't fully developed till they're 26 or 27. So that's what I have to deal with every day at Oak Cliff. Um, but uh, so it's been postponed, but it's supposed to start Wednesday is uh, the latest I've heard. Obviously, there's not an American team in the America's Cup. And I want to bring it back to the steel structure. So any boat that's a racing boat is essentially a structure of loads Steel, carbon, tungsten, cobalt, you know, whatever it is, Kevlar, fiberglass wood. It's a, it's a structure. And then the hulls, the lighter you get and the more you push the tolerances are really just designed to keep the water out. So you don't, and it's airplanes is the same kind of idea. You don't put structure or weight where you don't think there's going to be impact. Clearly, American Magic did not intend the boat to go full flying and come down on its side like it did. Now they've crashed and there's video all over YouTube you can watch for all of the boats that have gone up and come down. And Terry Hutchison talked to me about the fact that it was amazing compared to the catamarans that are like, and then you know they torque and they slam and they pitch pull and they, you know, they twist. So the Ameri these, these huge flying machines come down and it's more like a whoosh and you can see it. Yes. They're like, you know, coming down, going from 50 down to, you know, 20, 30, 10, but they didn't intend that up and down. So from what I know, and I, you know, history could prove me wrong or right, is that was literally just a panel that was there to keep the water out that came down. And then once, once it broke, um, one of our graduates from two of our graduates from Oak Cliff are there. One of them, uh, Sean O'Halloran, who's one of the grinders, and he also was extensively involved in the the 
fixing of the boat and the maintenance of the boat. And they knew all of the PR when they're like, we're going to go back, we're back. Yay. They were saying it like holding half of their breath because they didn't have the time to get the systems working. The electronics that got wet, the, the foil can't arm control devices, all of that was still you know, just not in control. And you could see, if you look at the video from before the crash and after the crash, you can see Dean Barker just like af after he's just barely holding on. It, it, it they, with everything they did, I want to say that I'm very proud to have been there, to have been and hopefully in the future be their training partner because they did things correct. The ethics and what we do at Oak Cliff, trying to build good humans and trying to build leaders through sailing they did, and I appreciate every single person that was on that team. Um, part of the problem for this America's Cup, everybody's everybody knows that COVID shut down a lot of it. But what people don't understand, because I talked about the day in the life, that happens for two, three years. And every day you're doing development. One of my things, my specialty was actually sanding bulbs which you're like, okay, she was the young, dumb one that just kept sanding. You know, I get in the, the Tyvek suit and lie under the bulb and sand, but I was really good at feeling the contours and the designers would come down and we have discussions about what I was feeling, what I was thinking. And then they would get the feedback from out on the boat. And so as that, that design loop was continuing to go. Um, but uh, we would be able to change bulbs overnight and we would do two boat testing because we had more than one, more than two boats. Actually, we had uh, world series events where we would race against other teams, but there was, we had, we had one where we built. So on the America's cup boats that I did, you have a keel that's shaped kind of like that. And in an ideal world, you would like to be able to change the side um, kind of like in an airplane, you'll see where they they put flaps up and flaps down. So you would like to be able to do that. We knew it was illegal, but we wanted to just figure out what the effects of it were because maybe, it's, I love the America's Cup, maybe we could have sailed just with the keel and gotten rid of the drag of the rudder. Because a rudder, for anybody who's a helms person on a boat and you think you're in charge, you think you're making the boat go fast? No, you have one job. And the only thing is to turn the wheel, right? And the wheel turns or the tiller turns the rudder and the rudder causes drag. So you're technically only allowed to slow the boat down. You don't make the boat go faster from a physics point. So we were thinking maybe we can do that. So we built this structure with all these hydraulic rams and all sorts of boffins and electronics and everything. And we were like, dang it, we didn't, it didn't seem to work. We're really surprised. And we came out and it's because all the flaps had fallen off in the water and all we had was a keel frame like a honeycomb between the hull and the bulb. So that didn't work. Uh, sorry, I'm digressing. Um, the, the American magic, the racing is going to happen. We will see. I don't have any good scuttlebutt from my Kiwi friends or the friends on the Italian team, but the, the thing that's crazy about the America's cup is that American magic, as far as I understand is definitely planning on doing it again which is super amazing. You don't remember, sorry, remember what I was saying, is that the fact that the COVID was there, they didn't have the time to do that development. And what people don't even think about now is that there was a whole year and a half before of delay because the Italians were doing the, the wings, essentially we call them the gecko arms, the gecko arms, and they were having trouble with the cant system and with the structure of, Team New Zealand was doing okay with the cant system, with the structure of the, the, the gecko wings, they couldn't get them strong enough. So that delayed it like three months. And then that changed their development and testing program. And then they canceled an event. And then they ran out of some money because they had canceled another event. And then they're like, okay, never mind. We'll just get to New Zealand early. And then there was COVID. So they couldn't go to New Zealand. So the development time what we saw when you look out there and you're like, oh, those poor guys are so slow. Well, they give them another 10 weeks and they would have been super fast. And that's what you saw with the Brits coming from being super dog slow in the Christmas Cup to winning the next event. So we saw development, the ugly side of development real time. And I believe that if New Zealand wins and the Italians have already said, if they win, they will have the same boat which everybody's like, oh my God, it costs so much money.
But if you have used boats, then you can sell a used boat. The big team makes the money and the little and startup teams, which is what American Magic was because they haven't they hadn't been in existence, can buy used equipment and use that to develop. So you end up building. That's how you get 12, 13 challengers. It's not by just magic or by saying only Americans on the boat. All those things are good, but what you need is you need that entry ramp where you can have less expensive boats and and have people that are learning and increasing. So the final steel story, I got one more steel story, is that as far as I know, the big, big reason that Team New Zealand won in Bermuda was actually steel. Because we talked about the Italians had so much trouble with the carbon wings, the gecko wings. Those things take forever to build. They're autoclave, they're milled, they're solid, they're structural, there's design. And I don't remember off the top of my head, but it was like months to build a set of foils. Team New Zealand saying, well, we don't have a lot of money, but we got a lot of brains and we'll try different stuff. They said, well, what happens if we just forget about the shape? Because we don't know how the shape's going to be in terms of the, the drag. What about if we just go and build some cheap ones out of something like, I don't know, steel? And then we can have a bunch of them and we can do better development. And that's what they did. And that's the reason that they were so much faster is they were able to do increased development because they were using a cheap steel as opposed to an expensive carbon. But that was expensive in terms of material and in time and in design. And in the end of the day, money never wins the America's Cup brains and best use of your assets, including time is what's successful. And it probably goes across many other um, areas. So with that, um, I'm going to open this up for any questions that anybody has. You can jump on. I see Joanne Cantini. I need to call you about Bridgeport. And I saw Chris Wick earlier. Uh, just to shout out, David. It, 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 yeah. Can you speak a little bit about the, uh, uh, the design changes that went from a regular sailing ship to the foils. And, and I'm sure there was a lot of angst about that from various sides, but uh, it goes back a while, but it, it, it was truly a, a huge change. Um, it, 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 it was definitely a huge, huge change. Um, the history, history side of it is the reason that we went to the multi-hulls was because of a deed of gift challenge. So it was a mistake. The America's Cup is um, challenged. It's essentially based off of a duel. Like I'm going to come with pistols at dawn behind McGregor's barn and we're gonna fight it out. So you have to say, I challenge you. And the honorable thing to do back then was like, I agree in this boat at this place. Um, and so the if you don't have that agreement, but there's a challenge, you don't have a challenge in hand and you don't have that agreement and somebody comes in rogue and challenges you, um, you have to accept it. And if you can't agree, then you go to what's called a deed of gift challenge. And that basically says, and Steve's probably going to be better on this than me, but you can look it up. Basically says any boat that's this big, like 90 feet by 90 feet, they were thinking schooners and barges. And you go on a windward leeward, and then you go on a triangle. So these huge, massive courses. So we ended up with catamarans and, and trimarans. So then, then they're like, okay, we're going to go back, but we're going to make it for TV because nobody understands sailing. So we're going to make it in you know, these huge catamarans in San Francisco. And of course, that was, again, a development course, a development class. There was uh, some major carnage. Some one person, a friend of mine died, um, was drowned on a boat. It was, it was, and the other thing that Russell Coots, who's a brilliant sailor and quite a good marketer, just completely missed the boat on is that a 72 foot cat and a 25 foot cat painted the same with the camera zoomed in to this, make them fill the screen. It looks the same, right? So the huge cats then got downsized for Bermuda. And then we had that, but there was a lot of the purist and the people that had the money and also the bulk of the yacht racing in the world is on monohulls. So that was the push to bring it back with Team New Zealand and with the Italians challenging to monohulls. At the same time, there was pressure to say, 
but they have to go fast. And that's where they came up with this foiling boats. Now, when that is the way the world is going, and again, I am, it's not my favorite boat. Part of it's because I haven't sailed on it. If I sailed on it, it might be different. But the, um, the, if we had had the proper development time and the plan time, I think there would be many less, many more people saying that was cool as opposed to, well, that was a lot of money. What happened? Right. So that, that's where it went. It was supposed to be in TP 52s ish. If, um, American magic one, I hope that helps. I don't have any like real answer other than this is the way it is. And when you try to get people to agree, that's, that's what happens. Anybody else? Just unmute yourself. Hey, it's Joanne. Can you hear me? Yeah. So what's happening with Bridgeport? Or you can talk to me another time. We'll talk <laughs> another time. We're looking, okay. Well, we have WindQuest, um, who, which is the DeVos's, actually, because we're, we, Oak Cliff is the training partner of 11th Hour Racing for the Volvo, for the Round the World Race, sorry. Um, and Mark and Charlie are graduates. We uh, have a helix for anybody who wants to go towards the Olympics, and we're the official training partner of the World Match Racing Tour and of American Magic. Um, and But I grew up in Michigan, where Mr. DeVos grew up, Doug DeVos, and um, he came to visit Oak Cliff two summers ago, and about three weeks later, I got a text, do you want WinQuest? Which is, and I, I was like, yes. Um, it's an 86 foot maxi boat. And so we are doing uh, Chicago, Mackinac, Port here on Mackinac, and then either the Trans Superior or going out through the St. Lawrence Seaway to Newport. And we're using those as three intensives in our maxi program so that we will be able to train the next generation. And we're able to put 15 year olds and above on these boats uh, so that uh, they get the experience, which is hard right now. It's hard for a 15 year old because there's old people like me who are still doing it professionally. And, uh, it's, and then there's this whole, there's whole nother thing about pros and what have you, but, um, Oak Cliff is the place to go, especially if anybody has a kid that's just obsessed with sailing and they drive you crazy because every day they're going to do something else, send them to me, let them drive me crazy. And I'll send them back with a little more direction. <laughs> I have a 16 year old Dawn who not, she's not mine, but she, she needs, she needs to join at the next level. She's here in Jamestown, but um, maybe I need to send her to you. Yes, please. Hi, Hi by the way. <laughs> Hi. We definitely want, um, we try to have 50% uh, women and uh, with this whole diversity and inclusion and equity, uh, I had a lot of board members when, you know, when it all first started happening, and they're like, what are you going to do about diversity? And I said, we are diverse. And our brochure that previous year had me, Susie Leach, so two old white women, um, Andres, who's from Spain, Lottie, who's black, was steering the boat, and Mark was there, and he's gay. And I'm like, we're good. <laughs> we, 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 and, and the only trick to diversity is saying, yes, please, open the door. Yes, you can. Because people that are traditionally, uh, you know, not as confident because they've been trained to be not as confident, um, they need to be asked two or three times, right? So if you're if you're discriminated against class, you need to have just have somebody say yes, please show up, go sailing. Of course you can, and that that is the the trick with uh, with Oak Cliff for having really cool te teams of people. Um, another question, what about older people like us? And, and I have to agree with you that you're so old. I think I'm <laughs> older than you by a few months, actually. Um, we have the oldest person we've had in program is 72. Okay. So, and he was in the high performance. So foiling on NACRAs and 49ers. So we do not discriminate on age either. For people that aren't ready to like jump and capsize and put on wetsuits at age 70, uh, the match racing offshore, we have it's really kind of fun. And it's usually the adults that are older. Like we have, we always have probably two or three somewhere midlife aged people that are changing careers. They come, 
Um, and they're the ones that are concerned. They're nervous. They're um, like, how are we going to deal with this? They're hesitant. And once they get in program, the kids are like, hey, how's it going? I'll tell you an off color, not good story. Um, it was a funny story. So we had one group where we had a lot of young girls, um, a handful of young boys and three women that were 50 to 65. And they're like, we're in, we're staying in the bunkhouse. So they're in bunk beds in program and doing mat tracing. And the last night, the, the young girls decided to have a lingerie fashion show, not with the boys, but a lingerie fashion show. And they evidently, when they were changing, left some in the, in the women's bathroom. And this woman went, this older woman went to the bathroom in the middle of the night and she was like, what the hell? So she took a picture of lingerie on the, um, on the floor and sent it to all of her older friends. And the best response was, that's interesting mosquito netting they use on those boats. <laughs> so you just never know what's going to happen. It, and, it, and it's a really nice dynamic of, again, just people bonded by sailing and trying to be good human beings. I sail with you guys down Oak Cliff, but... Um... I'm back. Yeah. Right now. Oh, you're breaking up a little bit. We will be um, there. Is this there any, ch- any plan to have? But is there any way to have a, a program here, even with Sail Newport? Um, what we try year to do, round? this is a common um, question. We really say that it's so much easier, especially since we have the high school. It is so much easier to transport the people to us than try to create a program somewhere else. With mm-hmm. that being said, we're totally happy if anybody wants to copy all of our stuffs on the website, including our COVID protocol, including our Apple Davids, um, including the Helix, how to get to the Olympics. We're like the open source of sailing. Awesome. Joanne, I think we have a challenge. Joanne, I, I, I have a question in the chat box for you. It's asked, did an all-female team from America make any difference for the numbers of women sailors represented on teams from other countries? Not enough. That's a really good question. And I don't have statistics, but in terms of the statistics for um, sailing and boat ownership and the anecdotal in America, absolutely, from boat owners to sailing, you know, and like at Oak Cliff, again, because of our attitude, it's weird. If some, if we're on, a, on the race course and there's a couple teams with only men, we're like, what's wrong? Oh, that's right. There's no girls on that boat. Uh, internationally, it's different. Culturally, it's different. I will tell you a couple of good points is that the Olympics sailing is the first sport to have equality or equal number of athletes, which is what was supposed to be Tokyo, which will be Tokyo. Um, and then in 2024, as long as the IOC actually approves a double-handed offshore, which I'm fighting with them a little bit about now, um, we will be the first sport to have equal number of athletes and equal number of medals available to male and female. So that is huge. Um, in other countries, it's a little bit different in terms of uh, shorthanded sailing in, in Europe. Uh, there is a fair amount more um, opportunities there in the smaller boats, single-handed, not in the team sports. And then you have Ellen MacArthur, who is a pioneer excuse me, racing around the world by herself. And what does she end up second? She's like this big. Um, She's tiny, 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 and a great person for the sport. And she was managed by, um, trying to blank right now, I'm sorry. She was managed by a guy who then started his own marketing company and then was the head of the Volvo. And he's the one that put in the, uh, the rule that you could have either... Seven men, nine, if it was seven men and two women or seven women and two men, or you could have 11 women. That really changed it for the Volvo and for the offshore racing. That was a really smart thing. And a quick story there is I was up in Newport for Mark and Charlie's um, announcement. I flew, this sounds ridiculously snotty. I flew from St. Bart's and then took a quick flight up to Newport to go to their press conference. Then I come running in and I was like, it's in March. I was like, hey guys, 
aren't those rules great? I said, you're going to go seven and two, right? And remember, Mark and Charlie were my students. And Mark looks at me and goes, I think we're going to go seven and one. And without missing a beat, I was like on fire. I said, you know what? You're absolutely right. Every time I've sailed around the world, I've finished and I have never said, boy, I could have used another set of hands. I've said, I've got plenty of sleep. I don't need to sleep anymore. I didn't need any more help on the boat. And he looks at me, he goes, I think we'll go seven and two. I like, yes, yes, you should. <laughs> um, any other, Rachel, any other questions? That was the only okay. one in the oh, chat. Who's this? Tom, shout uh, out. Can you hear me okay? Can yep. you hear me? Oh, good. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for this. This is very, very interesting. I was in San Diego in 95. And I, I don't, I, and I, I thought it was America cued. Yep. Your video said Mighty Mary. Uh, the name of the boat was Mighty Mary, but yes, it was America Cubed, uh, the women's team. I have, I have my favorite. Nice. It's a, it's a, it's a little worn, but it's America Cubed from '95. Uh, I had I'm, the pleasure of being on a chase boat, ah. and a press boat, and I, I, I followed you guys around. I think it was the race where. The one before Dennis Connor, you beat Dennis Connor. Okay. But uh, that was a real thrill for a uh, a TV producer to to wangle a press pass and get out there and chase you guys around all day. Very cool. Was, I'm glad you enjoyed it, and I'm impressed that your shirt is on a hanger. Um, oh, it shouldn't. It should not be, should it? it no, should no, 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 no. It's very, folded, very right? well preserved. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the kids at Oak Cliff, it's on the floor, and I got to yell at them. <laughs> oh, don't do that. Anyway. All right. Interesting. Thank you. Well, I just, I, you know, I think the battle against Dennis Conner, you know, he was a, the sailing establishment and taking him to the ropes and, you know, was just a tremendous, you know, got in the spotlight, and it was such a tremendous, you know, thing that was happening. And, and then to get, you know, screwed over by, that establishment is just was just heartbreaking to so many people. Um, right. You know, I just it's it's curious. So let's not let Dennis off the hook here. Uh, you know, is you know politely, you know, the games or the psychological. Can you get into stuff that they were doing? You know, or you know the gamesmanship. You know, without without like I'm you know without getting too in the in the you know throwing them under the bus. Too well, much. I mean, the America's Cup even though we live and eat and breathe it and it's, it's our life, it still is a sport. And it's the sailing is probably more than most sports, a social sport. And you, and I tell the kids, you know, if they're a jerk, I'm like, you know what? Assholes don't last in this sport. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, because pretty soon you behave like that. And then you're going to get on a boat where I am the decision maker and you're not going to get on that boat and your career is going to stop. Like, oh, now Dennis is an exception because he was very talented. And there's a few exceptions. And I will say in match racing, this is just a fact, because it is so strategic and because you are either winning or losing and you're always, you know, fighting and you're always trying to wake up and figure out how you're going to screw the other guy every single move. And you at some level have to be slightly psychotic to believe that you can make physics go away and put the boat where you want to. It does have, we do have a few crazy people. And so all of us that match race are crazy sometimes, but um, overall they're pretty uh, nice quality people. And some people I've never sailed with Dennis clearly, but some people that have sailed with him, you know, love to hate him, but love him, you know, when you're inside the team. I will say that when I first got to New Zealand, it must've been on Maiden. I remember going up Nelson street. Or no, I was coming off the motorway onto Nelson street. And there was a big billboard and it had Dennis Connor's face and it was an advertisement for Band-Aids and it was crossed his mouth and it said Band-Aid, healing the wounds of a nation. So that was one of the other brilliant advertising campaigns for a, a country with sailing in it. <laughs> I do want to shout out because I see Chris there with his half models and everything. Chris was one of the... Um, the the steward of one of our Harrisoft Classics mischief that he and his wife just donated 
um, and a steward of the whole class. There she is. Uh, Say, how are you? Hello. <laughs> um, and we really appreciate it. And anybody who's in Oyster Bay can come down and go sailing. Um, we're doing specifically on the classics. We do Friday afternoons and Saturday afternoons with our supporters and we go out and sail around and what a pleasure it is. That was a positive of COVID because we used to have them and just race them on certain on one night and then weekends and just race. And because of COVID, we had to have people with their family bubbles and we're like, okay, we'll coach you from the rib and you will be able to go cruising on a beautiful, you know, antique, classic, well-preserved boat. So anybody who wants to, you are welcome to come visit us in Oyster Bay. We're still hoping for a chance to come over and take a sail on mischief. But I've been through a knee operation and a back operation and I'm still waiting for my other knee operation. And with COVID, I have no idea when it's going to happen. I'm positive. You'll be here this summer. I hope so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we're winding down. Let's see. David again? Yeah, this is a question for either Scott or Jim. Is this uh, program going to be available uh, for for further viewing? Yes, definitely. Uh, we're recording. It'll be on our website. Uh, we're going to create an America's Cup corner. Uh, similar to our Rebecca Lugans Corner. So you can see this and other exhibits that we've done about America's Cup. But this is going to be the premiere, obviously, now. Thank you. Sure. <sighs> okay, well, I am going to wind this down. I'm kind of tired. I've been dealing with my own medical issues. A house, sorry, a car drove through my house about a year and a half ago. So um, I I'm survived, so we're good. Um, but I, have, I actually, another COVID positive is that I don't think I would be able to travel and talk to people. So Zoom and this has been wonderful. I've truly enjoyed talking to you tonight. I hope you have as well. And again, go to Oak Cliff Sailing, come visit us in person, virtually. Uh, we have full COVID protocols on our about and policy page. And we're happy to share because we want people to be safe and out on the water. And spring is coming. Trust me. <laughs> uh, are you saying oak cliff or oak okay. cliff like cliff. you're an oak oak tree and you jumped off a cliff yeah got it thank you well I'll, I'll just finish it up i really appreciate everybody's attendance today steve and i really you know appreciate the work that you've done uh with us in the connection with harish uh don uh you are a rock star we really appreciate you and everything you've done uh for sailing and uh and just to be with us tonight and share some of those stories. I mean, time flies and, uh, you know, but it's it's a great legacy that you have. And uh, we just really appreciate you spending time with us tonight. So uh, kudos to you. And I hope to see you again sometime. Absolutely. Welcome. Thank Everybody you. stay safe. See you soon.